Hello everyone. Thank you for clicking on my channel. Welcome to the journey home. My name is Catherine and I live in Nova Scotia. This is a caption <clears throat> from the book called One Spirit Medicine by Alberto Villaldo, PhD. And the title of this particular chapter is called The Journey of the Healer, Shedding the Past and Healing Our Mother Wounds. There comes a time in every man's life when he must encounter his past. For those who are dreamed, who have no more than a passing acquaintance with power, this moment is usually played out from their deathbeds as they try to bargain with fate for a few more moments of lifetime. But for the dreamer, the person of power, this moment takes place alone before a fire when he calls upon the specters of his personal past to stand before him like witnesses before the court. This is the work of the healer where the medicine wheel begins. In the southern, southern hemisphere, the home of the earth-based traditions of the Andes, the Southern Cross constellation occupies a prominent place in the psyche as well as in the sky, much as the Big Dipper and North Gate guide residents of, of the Northern Hemisphere. The four stars in the Southern Cross orient the stargazer and symbolically reflect the progression through the four stages of the medicine wheel that culminate in one spirit medicine. The journey of the healer starts in the southern portion, portion of the medicine wheel. The south is considered the domain of the serpent. In indigenous cosmology, the Milky Way is the sky serpent. In all cultures, the serpent archetype represents sexuality and the life force. Eastern traditions associate the serpent with kundalini, a vital force often depicted as a snake coiled at the base of the spine. The serpent represents the instincts and literal thinking. Everything is just as we see it, without nuance or ambiguity, summed up in the expression, it is what it is. In this mode, feeling and emotion are not involved. Like the cold-blooded serpent, we act unsentimentally. In some situations, seeing through the eyes of the serpent is exactly what's needed. When you're in danger and fear might cause you to panic and make bad choices, acting instinctually can ensure your survival. If you are standing on an open mountaintop with lightning striking around you, it is not a time for reflection but for your serpent instinct to kick in and tell you to find safe ground. The serpent reminds us of our connection to the earth, the source of our sustenance and support. The physical realm of flesh, soil, and rock awakens our senses as, like the snake, we outgrow our old skins and leave them behind. The work of the healer is to shed the roles and identities that no longer serve you and trust that you can survive without them. Staying in touch with what your body is sensing, you can act instinctively without deliberating about what to do. A pregnant woman in labor doesn't ruminate on whether or not to give birth. She trusts in her body's innate wisdom and surrenders to the contractions. Serpent impels us to move forward when we need to shed old identities and make a radical change. If we get stuck in serpent awareness, however, we live mindlessly, concerned with our own well-being and survival, without regard for the feelings or needs of others. We cling to what we know, the identities and roles that served, served us in the past. Very often, these are identities shaped more by our social conditioning and the influence of our parents than by any conscious choice of, on our part. Because the primitive reptilian brain finds comfort in familiarity, under its influence we avoid change, even when the old roles no longer suit. A man marries, yet hesitates to leave his bachelor lifestyle behind. A woman marries, yet has difficulty moving away from her family to establish a home of her own. Someone recovers from a life-threatening illness, yet remains a patient, vulnerable, and afraid. 
When our eyes are on yesterday, we aren't able to recognize possibilities right in front of us. And just as the eyesight of the snake become less acute when it's about to shed its skin, our perception tends to narrow as we resist needed change. Seeing danger, not opportunity. We miss the chance to experiment with new ways of being that might make us happier or lead to greater self-discovery. Robin, a woman in her late 30s, who was the mother of two teenage boys, came to me for shamanic healing at a crisis point in her life. She was distraught because her teenage sons now seemed to need her only to do their laundry and clean their rooms, yet she had no identity other than mum. And as upset as she was that her role had devolved into being her children's maid, she was even more terrified of what her life would be like if she tried something else, perhaps a job in advertising, her previous career. Robin knew how to design magazine ads for women's clothing, but the field had gone on without her and she knew nothing about internet marketing, search engine optimization, or virtual storefronts. When she came to my office, Robin complained that life at home was making her angry and sick. She had gained 30 pounds, and whenever she tried to discipline her sons, her heart started racing, and she felt a headache coming on. Every morning, she woke up in a daze, unable to think clearly without several cups of coffee. She knew she had to change. I asked her to begin by eating the omega-3 rich brain foods that repair the hippocampus, explaining that this would help her break free of the old thinking that kept her locked in her role as mother and maid long past the point of it being helpful to her children or to her. I also asked her to stay away from gluten and dairy for a month and to see if she was reacting to either one and to avoid sugar and refined carbs. In our next session, three weeks later, I performed an illumination illumination to clear old imprints from the luminous energy field. Afterward, I lit a large candle that I keep on my desk. I asked Robin to write her most uncomfortable rolls on small pieces of paper, then to take each paper, roll it up, blow a prayer into it, and then hold the stick in the flame as it burned. Just as her fingertips were beginning to feel the heat from the flame, she was to drop the burning stick into a metal bowl I had filled with sand. This ritual, I explained, was a way of consciously releasing the worn out roles that were informing her old identity by symbolically reducing them to ashes. The first role she wanted to release was made. I am so done with that one, she practically shouted. Then she burned the roles of short order cook, laundry woman, wife, and finally advertising manager. In shedding that role from her earlier career, she opened herself up to a new role that incorporated both the changes in her industry and the changes in herself. She hoped to use her skills in a new way, perhaps in advertising, perhaps in another field. Shamans have long known that the neuroscientists are now confirming the power of ritual, ritual to brain, change the brain. Small rituals like the one Robin used help you lift your awareness out of your literal limbic brain into your higher order neural networks. As Robin committed her old roles to the fire, she let out a big sigh of relief. However, she decided to keep one role, mother. I will be their mom all my life but no longer the maid, she explained. Had Robin burned her old roles without first repairing her hippocampus? This exercise would have been little more than a quaint gesture based on good intentions. Good intentions are easily forgotten and willpower can dwindle away, making it extremely difficult to truly shift your mindset or behavior. After our session, Robin went home and informed all the men in her family, including her husband, that she was going back to school to learn about internet marketing. If they wanted to eat, they would have to cook for themselves. If they wanted to clean laundry, wanted clean laundry, they would have to learn how to operate the washer and dryer. And Robin stuck with her decision. 
For two weeks, her house was a disaster area with dirty dishes and dirty clothes everywhere. But then hunger and hygiene made the men in her household rise to the occasion. In the journey of the healer, you have to trust that just as the serpent is protected by nature as it sheds its skin, your soft, vulnerable underbelly will be safe without the roles and identities you discard. As the oldest student in her class at the local community college, Robin found her new direction frightening, and she had to restrain herself from rescuing her husband and boys from the mess. But repairing her hippocampus, the brain center associated with new learning, allowed her not only to release her old roles, but also to acquire new skills that would help her thrive as a marketing executive rather than simply survive as a housekeeper. Robin and I also worked to change her image of the mother archetype from that of a giant breast nursing everyone in perpetuity to a mother jaguar cuffing her grown cubs with a firm paw to show them when it's time to leave the den. Parsifal and the healing and healing the masculine. The legend of Parsifal, a knight of the King Arthur's round table, illustrates the archetypal quest for wholeness and healing, the struggle to let go of the identities of the past in order to evolve. For Parsifal, the work of the servant, the work of the serpent is to heal the wounded masculine, to embody a new, more enlightened masculinity by integrating his inner feminine qualities like beauty, feeling, and love that in most men lie dormant and must be actively awakened. Central to the Parsifal leg legend is the Holy Grail, the chalice of Christ, the embodiment of the healing feminine. The Grail is the object of Parsifal's quest. According to the legend, Parsifal, whose name means innocent fool, was an in infant when his father died. He was raised by his mother in the forests of Wales, sheltered from men and their warrior ways. But in adolescence, he saw a group of knights riding through the woods. With their shining armor and flying banners, they were irresistible to the lad. The urge to become a man and prove his mettle stirred within him, in him, and Parsifal decided to follow the knights on the quest for the grail. Parsifal's mother was distraught at the prospect of losing her son. She wanted him to remain forever her boy, safe by her side, at home. She knew well that if he became a knight, he would lead a life of conflict, battling enemies in distant lands. If you must go, she told him, promise that you will remain chaste and will ask no questions, and that you will always wear this homespun shirt to remind you of your mother and your her steadfast love. Being a dutiful son, Percival agreed to these conditions. When we're young, we follow the directives of our parents and the dictates of our culture, unaware of how constricting those prescribed roles might come, might come to be in time. Percival set out to find the knights, accepting the challenge to seek the Holy Grail. Soon after leaving the forest, Percival came upon the maiden Blanchefleur, or white flower, who was preparing a wedding feast. Blanche Fleur represents the pure feminine energy that exists within everyone, male or female. Parsifal must claim his inner lover if he is to become a whole man. But with his mother's words ringing in his ears, Parsifal upheld his vow to chastity and refused to marry Blanche Fleur, instead choosing a life of the warrior even today, our young men are initiated by war, not love. Continuing on his quest, Parsifal encountered the Red Knight, who had just come from King Arthur's court, where he had overpowered everyone. When Parsifal asked how he too could become a knight, the Red Knight sent him to King Arthur. No one at court took Parsifal cereal, seriously. And when he asked for a horse and the armor of the Red Knight, Arthur smiled. If you can defeat the Red Knight, he told Percival, the horse and armor are yours. 
to everyone's astonishment, Parsifal did not only had not only challenged the Red Knight, but won the duel, killing him. This awakened the Vera warrior in Percival. But behind the swagger, his masculinity was not yet fully formed. Under his armor, he still wore his mother's homespun shirt. Setting out again, Percival came to a castle that turned out to be where the Holy Grail was, under the protection of the legendary Fisher King. Wounded in his groin, some versions say because he misused his sexual powers. The Fisher King represents the man whose masculinity is incomplete. Because the king was unable to procreate, his land was barren and his subjects were discontent. This is the condition of the modern male who has not been healed by the sacred grail initiated by love. He may work hard to make his family happy, yet he is powerless to do so and feels unappreciated and unloved. The Fisher King gave Percival the Grail Sword. The sword represents the masculine principle charged with guarding the Holy Grail, the feminine force. The Fisher King hosted a feast and at the end of the meal the Holy Grail was brought out. Everyone watched anxiously for the legend said that it would make an innocent young man to ask the question, whom does the grail serve? What would release the grail's power, the elixir that heals all wounds? Alas, when the cup was passed to Percival, he didn't recognize it as the grail, heeding his mother's plea not to ask question. questions. He simply passed the cup along. To his uninitiated mind, the vessel was just another cup of wine. Parsifal woke the next day to find the castle empty and his horse saddled outside. As he rode across the drawbridge, the Grail castle disappeared into the midst, into the mist behind him. Parsifal went on to rescue damsels in distress and liberate castles under siege, proving his worth as a knight, performing the usual heroic deeds. At King Arthur's castle, the knights of the round table welcomed him, but as they were celebrating Percival's triumphs, a crone interrupted the revelry. The old woman scolded Percival for failing to ask the grail question, thereby losing the opportunity to release its healing power. For the benefit of all mankind, chastened and ridiculed by the old woman, Percival set out to find the grail castle again and rectify his error. But he wandered for years without success, like many men who cannot find a deep and abiding love or a sense of fulfillment. Finally, in old age, Percival met a group of travelers who berated him for wearing his armor on Good Friday, a holy day. The knight removed his armor, and with, and with that he immediately received directions back to the Grail Castle. There, at last, or so we hope because the story ends before the conclusion. Percival posed the magic question, breaking the spell that had kept his masculinity wounded like the Fisher King's drinking from the vessel of pure healing feminine power. Percival became whole. It is only when a man sheds his armor, his warrior persona, that he can drink from the grail cup and be healed by the divine feminine. The Holy Grail is what all of us are searching for, men and women alike. The elixir it contains can soothe the wounds inflicted upon us by our violent male-dominated history and the dictates of our parents and our culture. Like Percival, many of us don armor, a business suit, or a tough attitude, for example, and head off to battle each morning, freeing the castles under siege, but receiving no gratitude or satisfaction for our efforts. As long as Percival remained tethered to the past and his identity as a warrior, he couldn't evolve in, into the man he was meant to be. He couldn't fulfill his promise to retrieve the grail. So the people of the land suffered, male or female, when we finally let go of who we think we're supposed to be and shed our fear of disapproval. disapproval we open our eyes to the new opportunities we encounter. We're no longer afraid to be curious, to ask questions, to take risks. But first we must, we have to take off our armor and shed the homespun 
mother garment underneath. It's daunting to walk away from familiar issues and battles, to put down the sword and remove the emotional armor, but it's a crucial step in our evolution. Without taking this step, we will not recognize the grail and release its healing power. We may not even realize that we're holding on to the role of the misunderstood, underappreciated warrior, continuing to blame our parents for opportunities we didn't have and what we failed to become. But to break out of this victim identity, we have to recognize that our parents too lived the Percival myth, as did their parents and the generations before them. The journey of the healer involves breaking the chains of blame and stepping into a new role, writing a new story to free not only ourselves, but also future generations. Throughout our lives, we will continue to shed identities when, like the serpent's skin, they become too tight. Eventually, we will discover that all roles are simply suits we hang in the closet to put on and take off as circumstances require. If you've done the work of the South and find your personal grail, you're free to be the dreamer instead of the dreamed, the healer instead of the healed, the creator instead of the passive recipient of your life. Upon completing the healer's journey, you will find yourself facing in a new direction on the medicine wheel, west, the way of the jaguar, which we will cover in the next reading. Fascinating um, books that this man writes. I really, truly enjoy them, and I hope you enjoyed it. Too. I believe the next reading is going to be um, The Journey of the Divine Feminine. Right, it is. God bless you guys. Thanks for joining me. Bye for now.